We are really, really invigorated and, and are really pleased by your very enthusiastic response to our forum. And as a series, we are as excited that we can learn from each other and that we can tonight cross-pollinate our research updates at the service of our athletes. It's therefore such a pleasure for our foot and ankle section as a group to kick off this monthly series of online forum. And tonight I look specifically forward to the very interesting topics and the future monthly topics as well. So stay tuned over the course of the next couple of months. So let's now highlight the major topics in the foot and ankle chapter tonight, presented by world leading experts in the field. For practical reasons, we will take some questions at the very end, facilitated by the moderator's pearls wrap up after each talk. Now it's my pleasure as a moderator of the session to present to you the lineup of tonight and we will ignite the first session with the contribution of Dr. Celeste Geertsema. Dr. Celeste Geertsema is the first female physician at a man's World Cup ever and that was in South Africa 2010. She has worked with FIFA for over 10 years now as a medical officer and she is renowned as a high-end sports medicine clinician with specific focus on female football, as well as football injuries and <coughs> prevention. As an assistant professor of clinical medicine, she also lectures at the Well Cornell University. Tonight, she will involve, uh, or uh, she will present to us the sports medical management of the acute lateral ankle sprain. Dr. Celeste. Thank you for the kind introduction, Peter, and good evening to everybody. It's really exciting to be part of this um, group of speakers using this new format and talking about two topics which we all really enjoy, ankles and football. I'm going to be talking to you tonight about uh, the management of acute ankle injuries in footballers uh, from a clinician's perspective. And I'm aware of the fact that this audience most likely already has a lot of experience with managing football injuries. Um, but what I really want to do for the next six minutes is to concentrate on the points of difference we need to consider when we're dealing with professional footballers as opposed to the general, general sporting um, population. But first, why are we talking about ankle injuries in football in the first place? Because it makes up up to 30% of all football injuries and up to 12% of time loss injuries. So it is a significant problem. And if it's left untreated, 40% of those with an ankle sprain may end up with chronic instability or osteoarthritis. And it's really sad to know that up to 6% of ex-professional footballers already have ankle arthritis. So the first consideration is the mechanism of injury. The mechanism is important because it determines which structures are going to be injured. And specifically, we know that foot pronation combined with external rotation can result in syndesmosis injury. And we have to appreciate that the ankle joint is actually not a true hinge joint, even though some authors would suggest that it is. And if you look at the ankle prosthesis, you might be forgiven for thinking that it is a simple hinge joint. But the reality is that the talus can rotate in the mortise, and this is where the syndesmosis is at risk. So the reason this is important is that we know the mechanism of injury in football is different from that in the general population. In sports like cross-country running, for example, the majority of ankle injuries will be straightforward, non-contact, inversion injuries. But in football, the mechanism depends on the position of the player. So whilst in up to 80% of goalkeepers, uh, they will have a non-contact and most likely inversion injury, the same is not true for field players. So we know that up to two thirds of field players will have direct contact injuries, such as during a sliding tackle, and often from the lateral side with an eversion mechanism of injury. So it's also important to note that almost half of those will have a pronated foot at the time of the injury. So if there's an element of rotation as well, then the likelihood of a syndesmosis injury increases significantly. The difficulty of course is that the history we obtain from the patient is often very unreliable. But here's the first little bit of luxury we have in professional football. The video replay is not. So my advice would be that if there's any recording of the match, it's absolutely worthwhile trying to find the footage, looking at the mechanism of injury, 
And if there's any eversion or rotational element, you should have a high index of suspicion for a more significant injury. The second consideration is imaging. So we've known for some time that the examination of, uh, of an ankle sprain in the first 48 hours is unreliable. And we know this is because of um, swelling, pain, and perineal spasm, for example. So therefore, the first visit in the first 48 hours um, is not really to make a definitive diagnosis, but it, it's rather to act like a triage. And what we want to do is exclude significant injuries like fractures, and we want to protect the ankle with some form of brace or boot. We also know that the incidence of ankle fractures in football is actually very low, 5%, as opposed to, say, 15% in the general population. But here's the problem. I think we'll all agree that footballers are not normal people. Not only is football the profession for footballers, for, um, but they're also very expensive assets for their clubs. So as a sports physician, you can't afford to miss a fracture in this group of patients. So even though we use the Ottawa ankle rules in the emergency department to determine who needs to have an x-ray and who, who doesn't, we have to be aware of the fact that the sensitivity of the Ottawa ankle rules is actually not 100% as first reported. These rules were developed by a Canadian emergency physician in an effort to save costs in a public health setting. And clearly, professional footballers do not fit in the, city, in the setting. So it's my opinion that in the case of professional footballers or any other professional athletes for that matter, we shouldn't be using the Ottawa ankle rules as part of our standard assessment because cost is not an issue in this group and we can't take the risk of missing a fracture. So similarly, we should be aware that even though the delayed examination can be very valuable, there are still some limitations. So both delayed ex physical examination and ultrasound has a have a higher sensitivity for diagnosing ligament ruptures and particularly lateral ligament ruptures. So we know that if you have a combination of bruising and tenderness over the ligament and then you add a positive anterior drawer test, the sensitivity goes up to 96%. So that's great. But we have to also be aware when it comes to the rest of the ankle, we have to acknowledge that the value of palpation is limited by the fact that many of these structures are very closely related or even overlapping. So for example, up to 40% of patients with ATFL rupture will also have tenderness over the inferior syndesmosis, even though they don't have a tear of the syndesmosis. Similarly, 60% might have tenderness over the medial malleolus and the deltoid ligament because of contusion or compression. And we should remember that when you palpate for the calcaneofibular ligament, the perineal tendons actually run precisely where you're palpating. So are you palpating the ligament or the tendon? Even the anterior draw test can be misleading because the deltoid ligament, if it's not ruptured, prevents a straightforward anterior glide. So all these limitations need to be taken into consideration. And for me, the most important thing is that we know that there is not a single reliable syndesmosis test or even a combination of tests. We should also remember that patients with lateral ligament injuries often have associated injuries. So in a retrospective MR study we've done in Aspatar in 2014, we found that up to 20% of patients referred for an ankle MR scan after a lateral ligament injury actually had a syndesmosis injury. And these were not just footballers, this was the general population or general athletes, and of course in footballers it might be higher. So the same study also revealed that 8% had osteochondral lesions of the talus, and of course there were um, lots of bone bruise, contusions, and deltoid ligament injuries. So my point is this, don't hesitate to use imaging early if you are dealing with a professional footballer. We would love to believe that we have magic hands, but the truth is we just don't. And in the case of professional footballers, they usually need a definitive diagnosis and they need it like yesterday. So the third uh, consideration is that treatment should be individualized. Even though most clinical guidelines would recommend early functional rehab for lateral ligament injuries for all grades, professional footballers with grade three ruptures are often referred for surgery. So this is still a bit controversial and we don't have enough time to discuss this in this particular talk, but we need to use a shared decision-making model when we discuss this with a player. My last point is this. We should not forget that no two players are the same. 
We are just starting to explore the differences between men and women in football medicine. But one thing we already know, and that is that si one size definitely does not fit all. So to summarize, when dealing with professional footballers, we should consider the mechanism of injury, facilitate early imaging, and ensure we individualize the treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Celeste, and great to kick off this uh, session with a wonderful first contribution. What we take from this first contribution is that there's no such thing as a simple ankle sprain, that we have to, at all stakes, avoid an evolution towards chronicity, where osteoarthritis should be the first uh, victim, and that uh, there's no two players that should be treated the same for this particular reason. The mechanism of injury varies based upon the position of the player, goalkeeper more non-contact, field player more contact, and there's an essential tool available to triage adequately post-trauma and also after delayed examination. Lastly, there's a very low threshold for imaging. Now, we swiftly move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Bruno Ollery. He is a passionate sports surgeon from France with specific focus on the minimal invasive approaches in the athletic foot and ankle injuries. He's a member of the European Foot and Ankle Society, as well as member of the French Foot and Ankle Society, an active member of the SFA, the Société Arthroscopie Française, so the French Arthroscopic Society. He will indulge us in the percutaneous techniques of hallux valgus surgery and the potential advantages for the athlete. Dr. Bruno. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Popovich, for this invitation. Dear friends, uh, we are going to speak about uh, uh, allux valgus and the particular treatment of allux valgus in professional athletes using percutaneous surgery. I declare no conflict of interest. Allux valgus is responsible for a variable discomfort. It can be pain related to the shoe conflict or joint pain. Five types of reason for consultation can generally be described. Allux valgus with painful internal conflict, allux valgus and metatarsalgia. Metatarsalgia is often discovered on clinical examination or occurs after a long effort. Metatarsalgia and allux valgus. Allux valgus and metatarsalgia should be treated separately. And AMR2 and allux valgus here also, each deformity will need a specific treatment. Allux valgus can be a family deformity. The shoes has the valgantic effect on the first two. And the more the shoes is tight, the more this effect is important. This is especially true for soccer players and dancers. Flat foot by the lengthening of the medial arch increase the valgating effect and on the allux. Ligament hyperlaxity is also a contributing factor. And it's important to note it that hyperlaxity and flat foot are pejorative factor for the treatment results. Turf 2 and its after effects lead to post-traumatic allux valgus, which is a separate entity. Then at different level, the following deformities can be observed. Big 2 valgus, first metatarsal varus, sesamoid belt dislocation, abductor allusis tendon passes into plantar position, resulting to an aspect of medial rotation of the first two. The procedure needs to comply with an intricate analysis of the X-ray. A metatarsus varus could be corrected by percutaneous surgery, but studies shown that in dermetatarsal angle, correction is limited between 3 to 5 degrees. The DMAA is an excellent feasibility indicator. When irregular, this angle could be easily corrected by percutaneous surgery. The position of the sesamoid belt needs to be appreciated and corrected if necessary. The length of the first metatarsal is also observed. It could be uh, shortened is in case of excess, but 
taking a risk of instability. The global food architecture is noted, the Egyptian food is most frequently observed in Aluxalgus. Then we will ask for an X-ray re realized in the complete weight bearing. The, indi the incidence of this X-ray is tilted 20 degrees from the vertical and centered on the first cuneometatarsal joint. The good quality of this X-ray could be checked easily by a clear visibility of the first cuneometatarsal joint, a rounded aspect of the metatarsal heads, and the proximity of the sesamoid to the metatarsophalangeal joint line. A specific equipment is needed for this surgery. Beaver and blades are thin and ensure a high level of precision. The elevator is used to, discharge the so to detach the soft tissue from the bone, creating a space in order to work safely. Straight channel burr of variable thickness and length for performing osteotomy and wedge burr also of variable size for bone resection. The motor is a crucial element each should have the same axis of rotation of the burr, on-off switch and speed adjuster should be controlled by foot pedal in order to control the end piece with the best precision. It must have a strong couple to allow a burr um, rotation during bony procedure at a very low speed which can not exceed 8000 revolutions per minute. The fluoroscopy is used to guide the procedure. Well, how to do this? The first step is the exostosectomy. For this exostosectomy, a medial approach is used. The blade is introduced in the first metatarsal medial condyle part. Once the bone contact is obtained, a working space is created using the blade and increased by the elevator. A wedge burr is introduced in this space and moved to perform the bone resection. Palpation and fluoroscopy ensures the resection is enough. Bone debris are extruded with the rasps and lavage. The absence of tourniquet helps to evacuate the bone debris and decrease the temperature to avoid bone burns. The second step is Isham Reverdin osteotomy. Isham Reverdin osteotomy is a distal metatarsal osteotomy performed at the metaphysis. It is performed by the same approach as the exostosectomy and the cut preserved the lateral cortex. Correction of the MMA is achieved by medial closure during forced virus first two. The lateral release or sesamoid belt release is performed by introducing the beaver blade through a dorsal lateral incision over the MTP joint space, lateral to the extensor allucis longus tendon. Then the blade is rotated outward 90 degrees toward the inferolateral corner of the phalanx base, the grade 2 is placed in forced virus to put the lateral capsule and ligaments under tension, allowing to be cut gradually. Achimostotomy is performed by a medial approach of the first phalanx. After realization of the working space with the blade and elevator, a Shannon burr is introduced to realize the cut preserving the lateral cortex. Medial closure is obtained during forced virus of the first two. The correction should be maintained by the specific dressing. This dressing is changed after 10 days. Full weight bearing with a special shoes is permitted the day after the surgery. The second clinic is planned one month after surgery. The patient is asked to practice his own rehabilitation. Third and last clinic is done after three months. The patient is then allowed to start a progressive sports activity. Alux valgus correction by percutaneous technique leads to reduce alux valgus angle by 13 degrees, intermetatarsal angle by 3 degrees, and DMAA by maximum 5 6 degrees. The various studies show an increase in the OFA score of 37 points on average and the satisfaction rate is around 90%. My take home message is, first, a good analysis of the X-rays is essential to take the good decision. Percutaneous surgery 
should be considered should should not be considered as a fashion. This is a clear surgical technique with good results, but also with risk. Best indication for allux valgus percutaneous treatment is mild to moderate deformity. Of course, sports athletes and especially football players are the best indication for this surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruno. What we take from this uh, talk is that a percutaneous minimal invasive surgery is part of the menu of options that the frequent and annoying hallux valgus can be treated with, especially for the athlete. When we talk about the athlete, a weight-bearing x-ray is essential and a clinical examination together with that is enough to prepare properly. Also, there is a need for a specific tool set of instruments to make sure that the percutaneous way can be effective, but also safely performed. And the post-operative management is, has to be individualized with bandages that are essential to work well, as well as the follow-up. 90% satisfaction rate is the aim and is, of course, what the athlete at least expects. Now we move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Atul Thompson. He is a PhD podiatrist and senior clinical researcher at the Aspetar Hospital for over seven years. He has a special focus on the player shoe and surface interaction, especially on different football pitch turfs. And he's a principal investigator on related research leading up to the World Cup Qatar 22 in collaboration with the global football boot manufacturers. He will indulge us tonight on the sport shoe surface interaction with his innovative concepts at the service of the athlete. Dr. Athel. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Popovich, for the, uh, for the kind invitation to be involved in this forum. Um, good evening from Doha. Masa al khair, as they say here. You're very welcome. I'm going to give a brief overview on some aspects of shoe surface uh, interaction in football, a little bit of a focus on uh, what happens between the studs of the shoe and the surface you're playing on, uh, and some surrogate mechanical measures that we might be able to uh, to gather from there. So it's been a good a good place for this. Uh, there's a big show coming up, as we all know, and uh, some fantastic stadiums uh, that will host uh, the World Cup in 2022. There's going to be eight stadiums and 84 training pitches. Uh, I'm told four of these training sites are simply for referees to, to get their training done. So you get an idea of the scale of this. Now in this, uh, with this huge um, event coming, uh, we have a company, Aspire Sports Turf, that's been working very hard to try and um, have the exact same grass, surface mechanical properties, um, soil constituents and so forth, so that players can uh, really experience a uniform and similar surface on each of the training venues and, and match venues they play at. These stadiums will have vacuum systems underneath them to drag water through should we get that rain that often comes in November and December in Doha. And they'll also be hybrid reinforced so they can put up with some match congestion. Um, over that time. So it's been a good time to gather data from playing services. Um, I'm giving this lecture from just here and you can see within a 10 kilometer radius or 20 kilometer radius, seven of the eight stadiums for the World Cup uh, can be traveled to. And the furthest one away is within 40 kilometers. So it's a real chance to see at least two matches in a day. And uh, I want to extend the invitation. You're very welcome. Please visit us if you do come. If you like looking at stadiums and grass and things like that along the way, like me, follow some of these sites for updates on, on how the construction and how the pitches look along the way. So when considering shoe and surface interaction, it's probably good to ask the players what, what they like. And uh, Mears did exactly that in, a, in Sports Medicine, a, a journal in 2018, where she asked a large cohort of professional players what they thought of uh, the playing surface and if it posed any injury, uh, any increase for injury risk. 91% of the players said they thought that surface can increase injury. Um, when pushed on what properties, they said hard, bumpy, inconsistent surfaces, or high and low grip. Um, they also mentioned that the, the type or condition of playing surface 
alters the, the, the footwear that they might ultimately put on their, on their feet. So this is a consideration for the athletes. So what is this shoe and surface interaction we're talking about? Um, when an athlete pushes on the surface, there needs to be enough resistance for that surface to push back, so to speak. Um, there needs to be enough grip so that when uh, you're trying to produce either horizontal or vertical force that the player can accelerate, decelerate, and then perform their turns. But what we're interested in is there an optimal zone of traction or surface hardness that the athlete can perform these movements um, to the best of their ability without uh, increasing their subsequent injury risk. Now friction is really a resistance to two bodies passing each other and it's often called traction when studded shoes are involved. There's two components of traction, uh, often measured uh, linear or translational traction which is in a straight line, uh, very important for accelerating and decelerating. And then there's rotational traction and this is the one that is often considered uh, to possibly increase injury risk. Athletes will say, uh, when you ask them about their mechanism of injury, uh, that they felt like their foot got stuck on the surface or wouldn't release or got caught in the surface. So Dracos uh, and colleagues looked at some cadavers and, and put these cadavers in different shoe and surface combinations and found that in high friction or high traction shoe and surface combinations, there was a very high load on the ligaments and a very high rotational torque stress. This has been done with athletes as well in a lab-based setting by Sinclair, where athletes ran and turned 180 degrees over a force plate, and the combination where there was a high uh, friction or, or traction between the shoe and surface put more, much more strain on the ACL when they were turning. The lower, lower friction shoe and surface combination put less. Interestingly, translational, the straight line traction, seemed to matter a little less to this relationship. So if we go back to our player, and we try to work out how or when or why they might get injured, we know there's an awful lot of uh, other factors that can come into this relationship. So why look at shoe and surface um, factors in detail? Well, I guess for one, they could be modifiable. Once we get close to game time, one of the few uh, things an athlete has control over is what they can put on their feet. And also we can talk to the groundsman about how they prepare training venues and match venues. So we wanted to start by seeing, is there any evidence out there? We conducted a systematic review and found that there were three studies in which uh, they've gone out and objectively measured the traction between the shoe and the surface. So they've rotated a shoe and picked up the amount of torque that there is and then looked at the injury rates. These three sports were in American football and over those three studies there was around 5,000 male athletes once they were pooled. If the shoe and surface came together to make high traction when you group the athletes, you're over two and a half times more likely to be injured. So there were three studies, um, one looked at ACL injuries, severe knee injuries, and then all lower limb injuries, which happened to mostly be uh, ankle syndesmosis and, and knee ACL injuries. And when you pool those, you're about 2.7 times more likely to sustain an injury if you're in a high traction uh, shoe and surface combination. Interestingly, there was no studies for soccer football that had done this, um, and only injury data within the NFL. So if you look at one of the studies, uh, where they went out and got the athlete's shoes, took them around to the playing surfaces they actually played on, and then looked at the injury rate. We found the low traction group had this many injuries, and the high traction group had a quite alarming uh, increase in injuries. So what might that look like? The best way to see that is in a boundary area, or an area where there is a certain amount of shoe surface traction, and then possibly a higher uh, amount across the sideline. So here we have a natural grass uh, hybrid reinforced pitch. The player is looking at the ball uh, and possibly the player, the other player pressing, steps over the sideline onto a higher friction surface and has an inversion ankle injury. I'm happy to say that the federations here at our stadiums that will happen in 2022, so the stakeholders like FIFA and the turf companies uh, that are preparing these stadiums have decided to make sure that there's five metres of sideline uh, in, the, in the match stadiums, so players have ample room to decelerate in those areas, and also three metres at the training sites. So hopefully we don't have these boundary areas. Of course, grass uh, is a living, breathing thing, and there'll be different uh, conditions within a single pitch, but this is a, a great leap forward. Now, we also know that grass species can, um, 
can affect the shoe surface traction and possibly go on to affect injury rate. And in Australian rules football, this was a case where rye grass, a cool season grass, um, showed less injuries or fewer injuries than Bermuda grass, which is a warm season grass. And that was put down to uh, climatic factors and possible shoe surface interaction. This was also um, uh, seen in European football uh, with uh, the warmer climate zones showing more ACL injuries and ankle sprains and the cooler climate zones having more Achilles tendon injuries. So we wanted to see here in Doha what happens over a season with any of these different grass species changes or different surface uh, condition changes. So over the course of a season on the national team training venue, we measured the hardness of the pitch, the, the moisture content in the, in the soil, humidity, uh, temperature, all different climatic factors. And we also measured the rotational traction. So we dragged around our, uh, our machine, rotated the shoes and got an objective number for torque measured in Newton meters. We tested six different shoes some of these shoes had small round studs and what's known as the AG outsole group or artificial grass group. Other uh, shoes had some blades or, or round studs or combinations of both in the firm ground outsole group. And then uh, finally, the soft ground outsole group had uh, tapered conical metal screw in studs. So just to show you the profile, uh, small and round and, and, and lots of them. Um, bladed and a little bit longer, and then the, the screw-in metal studs that we we're all familiar with for softer ground. So what we did was we measured these groups. Um, the soft ground studs are here, the gray group, um, and we looked at the rotational traction. So on the vertical axes, the higher you go up on this axis, the higher the traction was, um, or the harder it was for that shoe to release from the surface. We see in January, all the groups drop down. So the bottom group is this small AG outsole group, and they're the lowest for the whole season, but they drop down considerably in January. And that's because we have that cooler grass, that rye grass that was mentioned, that seems to have lower rotational traction. So it does seem that over these different months, you can tune in the shoe you're wearing to try and uh, attempt to get the, the desired traction between your shoe and surface um, as need be. So from there, we asked a lot of uh, physiotherapists and podiatrists that are involved in the game today uh, at some of the elite sports, elite clubs, and uh, also different football codes. And we really wanted to see what they thought about football shoes as you return to on-field rehab. In this case, we talked about ACL after ACL reconstructions, but we also had a good chat about ankle syndesmosis injuries. And at the end of this chat, it's, uh, it's open access. It's online at the Aspatar Journal, should you want to go into it. At the end of this chat with all the experts, we thought the pragmatic advice was to recommend that players stay in these smaller uh, round studs for their on-field rehab work in an attempt to decrease the rotational traction. Um, we would like their translational traction or their straight line traction to stay high so they can uh, you know, not slip, but this should decrease or minimize their risk of injury going forward. Um, and then they can start to move up through the shoe categories uh, as need be. So the recommendation is athletes should select footwear that has the lowest rotational traction values for which no de detriment in performance results. We certainly don't want to see athletes slip, but if it's a, a pre-season sponsor event rather than the, the World Cup final, I think there's a risk reward um, question there. So until we can get some of this information to people, one way to, uh, to judge what's happening at this shoe and surface interface is to have athletes use their intuition try on a pair of shoes, run a, a, a traction course um, in a given time, and then rate how they think that felt, whether that was too much traction, not enough, or just right. And then they can choose these outsoles that they prefer. Now, just a quick note that no matter which boot you're contracted with, now you can actually get the, the studs that you want in each of, uh, in each of those categories. So um, it's not a, a, you don't have to change down. You can you have the, the let's say kangaroo leather or the upper that you like, um, and just ask your athlete services for the outsole that might suit. And that's exactly what Harry Kane was doing here just before the Champions League final, um, the day before on the captain's run, if you like. He's testing out his soft ground shoe after running a traction course, testing out his firm ground shoe and seeing which feels good to him. So I think player intuition is, is very important. So summing up, 
the ground staff are key. They really are collecting a lot of data that we could tap into and try and understand how our shoes can, um, can work along with that information. I think we could use a functional traction course to subjectively rate football shoes. And I also think it boils down to not using a high traction shoe with a high traction surface. There's two things to come in to make this interaction and we can tune that uh, to our advantage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Atal, for sharing your really interesting and very innovative research with us. What do we take from this uh, talk? It's not just about the stadiums, it's also about the 84 training pitches where most of the teams will probably play much more on than in the stadium itself. There's also much more to it than just simple principles of friction and traction. And specifically, the sideline is much more of a consideration than we thought in the past. Now, clearly there's a high-end research interest into the topic, so Stay tuned and much more in it uh, with leaders like uh, Dr. Athol. So uh, with that, we can move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Kostas Epan Epaminotidis. He is a senior sports physiotherapist at Aspitar since seven years. He specializes in physiotherapy pearls on sports injuries in the lower limb. And he's involved as a researcher in the clinical applications of things like blood flow restriction training and many other innovative sport, sports physiotherapeutical um, principles. He will indulge us tonight on the advantages and advances in rehabilitation techniques. Uh, Dr. Costas. Thank you, Peter. And I wanna thank you and Dr. Popovich for giving us the opportunity to be part of this great project. Uh, with no further delay, uh, this short talk will be about um, some techniques that we use, actually a training tool that is called blood flow restriction training. And we're gonna talk about using it in the lower limb and a monitoring tool, which is the QF active range of motion device de uh, developed here at Aspidar, which is a new device to measure ankle range of motion in functional positions. So for those unfamiliar with what BFR is, blood flow restriction, it's actually a training method where we use an inflatable cuff to restrict the arterial inflow into the limb while completely occluding the venous return. What that does is actually uh, creating a blood pooling that triggers very beneficial responses that lead to muscle strength development and also hypertrophy. Uh, recent uh, research data also shows that we have a significant short-term reduction in pain, which is really beneficial in rehabilitation. Why should we use it in rehabilitation? Basically because we want, one of our major goals is to restore or preserve the muscle strength and the hypertrophy of that muscle. To do that, actually, traditionally, we need to, do, to use high-intensity resistance training, which is not always desirable when we have an injury or a surgery. Uh, because the loads from high intensity resistance training in the joint are very high. With blood flow restriction, we can use low loads, get similar results in muscle volume and, high, and uh, strength without having high joint loads. A very quick way of how do, how do we apply BFR is actually, first of all, checking about contraindications, meaning that we check about absolute and relative contraindications like unregulated diabetes, severe cardiovascular disease, and moderate to severe peripheral vascular disease. These are contraindications. When we clear that up, we apply the cuff in the most proximal part of the limb, and then with the use of a Doppler, which can be portable or built in in the cuff, we can actually measure the maximal occlusion pressure. From that, then we will estimate the desired percentage of occlusion that we want to do. Then we have to also estimate the appropriate external load that we have to put to do the exercise. The ways to implement the BFR in rehabilitation setting, actually BFR can be used in all stages, even in the immobilization stage where the limb cannot be used or exercised. BFR has shown that we can actually decelerate the rate of decay of the muscle volume and strength, even without the use of exercise. In early stages where only active motion or uh, very minimal resistance can be used, the use of elastic bands, light elastic bands and BFR can actually be very beneficial. 
Uh, the benefit increases when we go to partial weight bearing activities and more load. The maximum results from BFR come when we can actually do resistance training, low load resistance training and aerobic activities like uh, walking and cycling. Uh, very briefly, some parameters we have to consider when we're using BFR. We never completely occlude the limb because it's not safe. And we use ranges of occlusion between 50 and 80 percent, which have been shown to be very safe and also have the maximum effects in strength and hypertrophy. And we're using very low loads. The, uh, regarding the cuff with practical pearls, the wider the cuff, the better because it's more comfortable for the patient and we can actually um, achieve the occlusion pressure at lower pressures in the cuff. Uh, the external load, usually we have to test the one repetition maximum and we use 30% of it. Many people have advocated 20 to 50% of one repetition maximum. The training volume is usually the most uh, researched one it has been four sets with a total of 75 repetitions. Um, the, when for some reason we want to change that, other people have also used training to exhaustion, to fatigue to achieve the same desired result. At Aspidor, what we are doing is actually when we are not able to measure one repetition maximum test for reasons that have to do with the injury or the surgery, we're using, uh, the we keep the training volume steady and we're using the rate of perceived exertion scale in order to be able to monitor the resistance that we put. Therefore, we keep the training volume steady at 75 repetitions and we ask for the patient to give us a rate of perceived exertion of a maximum of 7 to 8 out of 10. Then, according to the patient's response, we adjust the load accordingly to achieve that RPE. And of course, we also monitor the pain responses during the whole process because we do not want to aggravate uh, symptoms. For the type of exercises in BFR, we actually use single joint exercises in early stages and we move on to multi-joint exercises. We use short rest periods of 30 seconds because we want to uh, promote the metabolic stress in the tissues. Uh, this brings greater results. As for the training frequency, we can go up to six times per week, but the minimum is usually three times per week. Now, moving on to the next, the, tra the uh, monitoring apparatus. Um, the QF active range of motion device was developed by one of our senior physiotherapists here called Mohsen Abbasi. And it's very simple. The idea was that with open chain range of motion testing, we do not get the full clinical picture of the mobility of the ankle. Therefore, we know that when we do range of motion testing in weight bearing positions, we have more um, appropriate results. The knee to wall test is one of these um, tests that actually is um, preferable because it gives us more information in a functional position. So clinically meaningful range of motion deficits can be identified using this machine, which is actually a specially designed platform that has a, an immobilization system that holds the foot in place and a combination of a goniometer and an inclinometer. The patient is placed on that, uh, on that device and then it can actually move in various locations to, uh, to measure dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, eversion, and eversion. It has been, uh, it, a reliability study has been done already inside Aspeter, and we've seen that it's highly reliable. Uh, the least reliable one with a fair um, component is uh, eversion. Excellent reliability was for plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So uh, we're currently using this device in our assessment unit. Uh, and we are collecting data that will probably be part of a, of a new study in the future. With this, I wrap up the presentation of uh, these two training and uh, monitoring tools. Thank you very much. Thanks you so much, Dr. Costas, and uh, really interesting topic. The role of BFR in the muscle strength, the volume to restore the normal functions. Uh, more to come on that as well. Now, when we talk about BFR, uh, I learned that it can be used in all stages of the rehab, especially in the early stages, which is, uh, is really promising to know. And the other thing is that the safety protocols, eh? um, they can now be validated, they are validated and can be implemented at the service of our athletes in a, in a safely manner and a safely fashion. So great news on that. 
And uh, with that, we will now move on to the talk of uh, Dr. Cristiano Erale. Uh, Dr. Cristiano Erale is the medical coordinator at Paris Saint-Germain in uh, Paris, France. He's a highly experienced sports medicine physician, a team physician and PhD lead researcher with specific focus and interest on injury epidemiology. Now, um, unfortunately, Dr. Erale cannot be with us live today since his team is competing as we speak against Manchester United as a preparation. So uh, luckily he was so kind uh, to pre-record his presentation. So Dr. Cristiano, all the best with the game tonight. Uh, we will stream now Dr. Erale's contribution to you all. Thank you and uh, to be part of this webinar and also thank you Dr. Popovic, uh, Nebo, for the invitation to be part of these fantastic books. So, um, uh, after uh, uh, having said how happy I am uh, uh, to be back home, let's go directly to the, to the point because uh, we have uh, to speak about uh, ankle sprain and return to play in only seven minutes. And I think that uh, is something that uh, deserves much more, but we will try, we will try. Um, so, um, a return to play is one of the most difficult moments uh, uh, for uh, the managing of elite athletes. And uh, we know uh, also from other lectures uh, of this webinar how complicated uh, can be ankle sprain. So I think uh, it's uh, really a big, big issue. So um, uh, you can imagine uh, uh, the pressure in, uh, in, a, in a club like Paris Saint-Germain Well, as you can see here, the video shows that uh, there's a clear inversion, contact, plantar flexion injury in the Mbappe player. And as we are learning tonight, and we know already from previous uh, research that there is no such thing as, an, as a simple ankle sprain. It can be cartilage, it can be ligaments, can be tenderness, impingement and so on, but also fractures. So the pressure is high, not only the pressure on the field for the players, the pressure on the field for the opponent. You will see in the video that there's a lot of uh, uh, animosity around that, as you can see here. But in general, we have to prepare our players. And uh, we can tell you that uh, in those uh, 18 days, we were not sleeping uh, very well. Uh, the 12th of August, we were facing the quarter of final Champions League and eventually semi-final and final later on. So, um, return to play is always a difficult decision with a large number of factors. In, especially with ankle sprain, we can have uh, consequences. Uh, return to play is something that can give you conflicts with coach, club, players, but more importantly, we can have serious medical conse consequences sometimes. So, we have to be careful in our decision. Also, as a professional, because we can have potential litigation, especially with these elite athletes. And we can be accused of negligence. And uh, on top of this, we can have loss of trust from the players or the club or the coach. And miscommunication is always part of a bad uh, uh, return to play process. Um, we is so important return to play that uh, uh, some episode uh, lead state to change laws uh, like uh, the history of Zachary Listed and his concussion in the United States. So, but let's come back to ankle sprain. In epidemiological studies show that uh, is one of the most uh, common uh, injury uh, in, uh, in sport. So uh, the best return to play model in, uh, in my opinion is the Creighton return to play model that uh, is created in three steps. The first step is the assessment of the health risk. So the assessment of the health risk imply a very careful evaluation of the short and long term consequences. So uh, the short uh, uh, term consequences uh, are the chronic ankle instability that can give a re-injury, pain, work disability and decreased performance. And the long-term consequences are mainly osteoarthritis. So uh, what the origin of the uh, chronic ankle instability? There are several theories, but uh, in reality we have an ankle uh, 
ligament damage. Uh, these give a damage also to the receptors, and uh, uh, this um, this uh, damage to the receptor create also a dynamic ankle instability, and this is a very high prevalent condition, more than 25% in pivoting sport. What about the osteoarthritis? We know that uh, this can be the 50-50, uh, the result of a single ankle sprain or multiple ankle sprain. This can give, uh, uh, the real osteoarthritis can have uh, a long uh, latency, but and so also uh, um, alterated quality of life for the athlete. We may not care of this because it's very far, it's 25 years, but we have to care because uh, immediately after two years uh, in uh, 20 to 100% of the population, we can also already see cartilage defect and this can impair the uh, career of a player. So then we have a lot of uh, other things to consider when we talk about return to play, like uh, the assessment of the activity risk and also the risk modifiers. Um, we, especially in elite sport, we have a lot of pressure from outside, but we don't have to forget that we have to negotiate the risk. We have to think about the well-being of the athlete and we don't have to take the risk when the real risk exceeds the risk tolerance. But also when we are very conservative, we have to consider that uh, the safe decision also imply uh, consequences like uh, the psychological uh, rebound of a player when uh, he is not able to compete. And we don't have to forget that to forget that also after return to play, we have uh, uh, to return to performance. We have to keep a tailored approach to the player with a specific warm up or taping. We have to use uh, painkillers. Hmm, this is a very delicate question. And we have to, con to continue rehabilitation. So the take home message is that a return to play decision in elite athletes post ankle sprain is something that we wish to our enemies. So uh, I hope to be in to have been in the time and with this i thank you again and it was very very good to be back home for a few minutes bye bye everybody thank you thank you peter i hope you hear me well because the connection is not or was not always perfect anyway thanks for the kind introduction and uh, you can interrupt me if you can't hear me over there um, I won't waste too much time uh, to a long introduction. I will give a short overview on the literature regarding uh, PRP. So we are leukocyte. Which PRP is the best of both? Probably leukocyte. Poor PRP is slightly better, but mainly it's been proven that PRP has a superior effect above hyaluronic acid, but of course uh, in wealthy people and professional athletes certainly are, uh, you can combine both if necessary. We are taking a look into the Achilles tendon and some recent reviews state that PRP has no additional value in the treatment of mid portion Achilles tendinopathy. The same results from this recent review and another one. And still, I want to um, convince you all of the possibility of the use of PRP in the treatment of the mid way to perform the procedure is under ultrasound guidance and quite gently because if we push quite gently we don't damage healthy tissue and we divide the PRP in the bad, the sick tendinous tissue. Um, that's what I want to emphasize on. Uh, when we see the PRP spreading, then uh, we know that the tissue is from bad quality, but it doesn't mean that there will be a better final result. What is a good indication? Um, a good indication is that we see during clinical examination that the, the tendon is swollen and painful 
what is a bad indication that the tendon is painful, but that we don't see any tendinosis on ultrasound, then it's more likely that there is a malalignment. This I've explained already. Then the choice for a long or a short axis view. Um, this is a short axis view, but it's on a patellar tendon. Um, to inject more precisely, I'm convinced that the short axis view is normally better, but in the Achilles tendon, I prefer the long axis view because of the disturbances um, of the air at both sides of the image. And that makes the visualization of the anechoic uh, zones less easy. Of course, we can also use PRP in the distal Achilles tendon. And for uh, bursitis, because there we don't use steroids because it's quite close to the Achilles tendon. When we take a deeper look into the fascia plantaris, it's a little bit similar with the mid portion of the Achilles tendon. Let's say if we have an obvious clinical image of a swollen, painful fascia plantaris, and this potent corresponds quite good with um, the zone, the, the thickened zone and the anechoic zone on ultrasound, this is a good indication to perform PRP treatment. When we move a little bit up towards the ankle, we know, as I told you before, that for osteoarthritis, we can uh, combine PRP and hyaluronic acid. Regarding ligaments, it's a little bit more complex uh, because I treat the different uh, ligaments differently. So for instance, for me, the calcaneofibular ligament is comparable with the medial collateral ligament of the knee, where uh, it has been proven already that PRP can have positive results. For an anterior talofibular ligament, it's different because there I am a little bit afraid of the pro-fibrotic effect of TGF beta 1 and that it would cause a little bit too much scar, scar tissue and impingement on the long term. But for the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, it has been proven again that there is a good result and a faster rehab. I shortly mentioned already the impingement syndromes in the typical footballer's ankle. We see bony and or soft tissue impingement, which can be at the anterior and or the posterior side. In this indication, PRP is not my first option. Um, I'm not a real fan of corticosteroids, but in this indication, is a better option. Shortly mentioning uh, the MTP1 joint, if we are dealing with uh, chronic lesions, chronic osteoarthritis, then I choose for a treatment with PRP and hyaluronic acid. If there is a real acute inflammation, I think you can use certainly in professional athletes a little bit of steroids to diminish this inflammation and to get the player back on the field as soon as possible. For traumatic medial collateral ligament injuries, PRP can be an option. I hope the connection was sufficient to you to understand everything and I want to give the word back to Peter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christophe, and uh, greetings from Doha to Belgium. The connection is uh, clearly improving, but that's thanks to the fact that everybody is uh, now gradually more and more online. Uh, immediately 1,000 people uh, sticking onto the system is indeed a challenging thing, and we thank you all for your loyalty to stick around. Uh, what we take from uh, Christoph's, or what I take from Christoph's uh, contribution is that a detailed knowledge and approach on PRP is essential especially if we consider different indications and different tissue types. And also that ultrasound is mandatory to standardize the treatment. Thank you so much, Christophe. And now we move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Alberto Grassi. He is an orthopedic surgeon at the renowned Rizzoli Institute in Bologna, Italy, and an award-winning researcher with special focus on lower limb, ligament, and tendon pathology as well. Greetings from Doha to Bologna, Dr. Grassi.
thank you, Peter, for the invitation. And it's a pleasure for me to be with you and with all this superstar, superstar team. And congratulations for uh, this forum and for, and for the book. So uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, Achilles Tender Raptor, uh, time to decide what is the best approach. Uh, basically, we all know that the Achilles tendon is the largest and the strongest tendon in the body. And uh, with this peculiar anatomy, it originated from the soleus muscle and through the, to the uh, medial and lateral gastroc and the inserts on the uh, calcaneus tuberosity. And it, its uh, biomechanical function is to allow ankle and also knee flexion. And in the sport and in normal life, it allows a static posture and provides also power during walking, running and jumping with a push-up mechanism. Therefore, it is, uh, this tendon is low overload in sport like basketball and especially in football. Uh, despite the uh, Achilles tendon rupture is not a common uh, injury in sport, however, it is not... Uh, you still see my presentation. Uh, it is not a, a rare injury. Normally, the Achilles tendon stretches for 4% uh, uh, of its length during the action, and the rupture occurs after 8% uh, of increase of its length. Uh, injury uh, happens also uh, always in an area of reduced vascularization at the, at the, with the smallest thickness in an area nearly 5 cm proximal to the Achilles um, calcaneus insertion. The mechanism is generally a dorsiflexion of the ankle with an eccentric contraction which happens during sprint and takeoff movement where uh, the load on the Achilles tendon can reach 8 times of the body weight. So which is the treatment, general treatment for Achilles tendon rupture? It is a jungle because we have a lot of uh, possible treatment depending on the patient from conservative, open, different surgical approach from minimal invasive, augment, uh, open surgery, biological healing, different rehabilitation. So there is a lot of literature and I try to summarize in this way. Uh, basically, in the first year and uh, several decades ago, Achilles tendon was also treated conservatively. Therefore, there are many uh, randomized trials and meta-analyses that compare the surgical and conservative intervention. This is one of the most recent and published in a prestigious journal, which is the BMJ, last year, and is a summary of um, a randomized controlled trial and observational study with more than um, 50,000 patients with a main age of 41, 44 years old. And this is an important aspect when we have to deal with the external validity of this data. And uh, this meta-analysis showed that uh, conservative treatment have a higher incidence of re-rupture, estimated nearly 1.6% uh, more than open surgery. And, uh, uh, but the surgery has a higher rate of complication. It's estimated in uh, plus 3.3%. But the surgery is not always the same. There are many different approaches, and the most uh, dichotomic way to describe the surgical approach is the open and the minimal invasive. This is a meta-analysis of only randomized controlled study, eight study with nearly 400 patients, that we performed with my mentor, Prof. Ned Amendola from Duke uh, University. And we saw that uh, the outcome of minimal invasive and open surgery performed with the mat and grip technique, a kilo or technique, are similar in terms of re-rupture and clinical outcome, but the minimal invasive surgery has a limited and lower amount of complication, especially wound uh, problems and infections. But we still have to keep in mind that minimal invasive surgery can put the sural nerve to risk of entrapment. Uh, what we saw was in a randomized trial, but if we look at the whole literature of uh, prospective and uh, retrospective study, several authors show that sural nerve palsy is higher with minimal, inv minimal invasive surgery. So we have to keep in mind all the different complications of the different approaches. In fact, with the original Mayan grip technique, which was one of the first minimal invasive technique described, uh, the sural nerve injury can reach up to the 60%. But this risk is lowered with modern techniques and or devices, such as with the technical modification of the original mind grip technique, open nerve exploration, ultrasound guided repair, tendoscopy, or with technical trip ticks, tricks using the devices, uh, such as the external rotation. But all these aspects require skills from the surgeon. And then also the post-operative rehabilitation can affect the outcomes. So there are many uh, randomized studies that compare the functional rehabilitation with cast immobilization. 
This is an important meta-analysis that shows that uh, uh, functional rehabilitation compared to immobilization leads to similar results in terms of re-rupture and outcome, similar stretching of the tendon, but there are no increased complications with a um, accelerated rehabilitation, but higher satisfaction and faster return to work. So functional rehabilitation is safe. But what is the functional rehabilitation? What we are talking about? Usually, the post-operative regime of uh, Achilles tendon surgical repair was known with being a cast of boot immobilization for six to eight weeks. Now, with the, the uh, functional rehabilitation, uh, there is early mobilization, weight bearing between 1 and 15, 14 days according to the different uh, protocol and different studies, and protection of the repair with dynamic brace, dorsal splint, and removable cut of semi rigid wrap. And then finally, there is also uh, the chance to uh, uh, do a uh, healing augmentation with PRP in the Achilles tendon repair because there is a promising result in in vitro in animal study uh, with increased strength of the repair tendon. But in the clinical literature, there are really, really few evidence. In this uh, Cochrane review of the 2014, there were not sufficient evidence to support the use of PRP in um, a surgical repair. And a recent published uh, multicenter study uh, of this uh, technique showed that there are no short term effects of PRP, but we have to acknowledge that uh, optimal preparation and optimal application for PRP, uh, as in Achilles tendon, as in many other pathologies, still have to be defined. So there is not a dead sentence for PRP. So summarizing the treatment, I'm not a big fan of natural metal analysis, but now they can give a, an overview of which is the best treatment. According to this very recent study, meta analysis published in IJSM, they concluded that minimal invasive surgery and accelerated rehabilitation is the optimal treatment. But as you see in this table, the statistical results are really similar between minimal invasive and open surgery. So when we interpret the, the, this data, we have to be uh, aware that sometimes statistically significant is not always clinically significant. That in the uh, control setting of randomized study, all the lesions uh, are standardized, and so uh, minimal invasive maybe cannot be uh, a minimal of repair with minimal inv invasive surgery, such as longitudinal split, and also the external validity of the result maybe are not adequate to be applied to young athletes, for example, footballers. So let's have a small overview on uh, football perspective and Achilles tendon rupture, because this is not a common injury, but it happens and can be very, very, very dangerous for the career of footballers. First of all, this uh, event is rare in professional sports. The, the data are limited. This is a study by UEFA and another study with uh, me and uh, our group and also with my friend Peter that try to uh, see the epidemiology of uh, Italian first division risk of Achilles tendon injury. And it is estimated that there is a 0.01 injury per per 1,000 hours of play, which increased risk in match versus training. And we estimated nearly one Achilles tendon injury per season in a, in a championship with 20 teams and 380 matches. And the mean age of uh, a football player with a killer standard injury is higher respect to other injuries such as ankle sprain or ACL injury, and it reached nearly 30 years old. This is the mechanism of injury we are trying to study. And we, you see that um, the main uh, injury mechanism is not a uh, uh, high de uh, velocity or uh, big trauma because the most uh, in common injury is a sprint from steel position, as you see in this patient, this is left, left uh, uh, foot. And you see that uh, patient, the footballers sprint from a steel position, he put the forward uh, lounge of the body weight and the injury happens uh, uh, after he do the uh, first step with the contralateral side. And another common injury is the high velocity injury. Look at the player with uh, yellow shoes. Is an acceleration during a high velocity run uh, where there is a change of direction with a crossover cut of the internal leg. So it's a reverse injury compared to the ACL injury, for example. So, as you say, the uh, treatment of uh, Achilles tendon injury in football is, uh, is uh, limited by the low evidence 
because this is a co uncommon injury. This is a one example of one case report reported for a uh, very popular Italian, uh, Argentinian player in an Italian team. And you see that those author uh, elaborated a treatment plan, plan for this player, including one orthopedic, one physiotherapy, one athletic trainer, and two team doctors. The player was treated with an open repair and a uh, post-operative protocol of controlled mobilization, rehabilitation, late rehabilitation, and return, return to play. Few words on the treatment. I say that uh, the minimal invasive surgery seems the most indicated for return, but in a professional athlete, maybe open repair is more popular and more indicated because of the long history of the technique, the predictable result, the technique which can be considered easier and can allow the treatment of the tendon in the case of pre-existing tendinopathy, can uh, allow handle to uh, allow, uh, treat complex and unusual lesion like split, there is limited lengthening of the construct in the post-operative period, and uh, uh, it's believed that have a better strength. The only price to pay is a possible wound complication. Then this is the, um, the post-operative regime of this player, and you see this is very complex, and it also allows the MRI evaluation at several time period. And when we talk about outcome, maybe in, uh, in, uh, in this kind of patient, in footballers, it's not important to have the proms, the subjective and the classic clinical scores. It's most important to see the performance at the time of return to play. So with my friend Peter, we did this uh, uh, analysis on publicly available data from transfer market and public website of 118 footballers with Achilles tendons rupture and repair. And we saw that 97% of players returned to football. Sport was reached at 6.5%. Six months and one month earlier was present in, in footballers uh, which uh, competed at international levels, but the official match was present at an average of 9.1 months. There was an, a rate of 8% of re-rupture with high risk in patients in the second division, uh, in second division, and most of re injuries occurred uh, as early re-rupture in the first three months after return to play, and many of them occurred in patients that forced their return to play before six months. And what about the performance? Uh, we saw a significant reduction on match played in the first season after return to play, 24 uh, uh, matches in the uh, season before injury and 17 matches in the following season. Moreover, 18 players played less than five matches in the, in the next two seasons following the injury, with higher risk of not returning to the same preparative level in patients with more than 30 years old at the injury and in the case of re-rupture. And it is important to say that the few patients that have re-rupture, 50% retired from football at an average age of 31. And we had a deep look in 11 Italian Serie A football players, and we saw that at two years, two seasons after the return to play, only, um, only 60% were playing in the same first division and 40% lowered their division, were in Serie B or retired or were in lower categories. So summarizing, we have to say that the best approach for uh, Achilles tendon rapid is not defined because open and minimal invasive surgery have a similar result. So complication should be considered in every patient regarding wound problem in the open and sore nerve injury in the minimal invasive surgery. Accelerated rehabilitation is, sa is safe and improves satisfaction and PRP or uh, biological augmentation are not routinely recommended. What, but when we, to, we talk about footballers, there are limited evidence, so the external validity of the evidence-based medicine maybe is not appropriate for this subtype of patient. Open repair seems the most reliable technique. The time to return to sport is long, usually uh, uh, more than six, eight months, and performance are affected after these injuries and can be also a career-ending injury. I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Alberto. And greetings from Doha to lovely Bologna. Uh, I really appreciate your contribution on behalf of the whole team and interesting data that you show, especially not just about the lesion, but on the management and especially the return to play, but not only the return to play, also the return to the level that is expected. And that's a new ground that we all want to dig in to have more appreciation on the real return to play uh, in the future. Now I have the pleasure to uh, wrap up the, the sessions with a uh, talk on the management of isolated syndesmosis in athletes. I have no disclosure to this talk and 
When we talk about syndesmosis injuries isolated in athletes, there's still a lot of controversy, but gradually more and more consensus. And thanks to the research from all our groups together all over the world, we are now gradually getting out of the hole of no knowledge and knowing now how to test for instability, how to choose the right treatment, and especially what we can explain our athletes on the return to play, the guidelines and the expectations once they suffer from an injury that is uh, an isolated syndesmosis injury. And the visual picture always prevails. This is how it works. Now, this is an athlete that is sent to us with an ankle sprain. You and I will agree that this is not an ankle sprain and it's not even a high ankle sprain. This is not an inversion plantar flexion injury. It is a dorsiflexion external rotation injury. So we have to speak the same language. And when we talk about ankle sprains, this is the most essential part, that we say there is no such thing as a simple ankle sprain. And our journey here with the team of foot and ankle at Aspetar started about six years ago, where we had the chance to evaluate an MRI on all the acute lateral ankle sprains that were sent to us. And strikingly, although the mechanism of injury is so different, the pathology is so different, still 20% of athletes referred for a lateral ankle sprain showed suffering uh, and uh, problems and evidence of syndesmotic injury over that ankle. So it is not the same mechanism, it is not the same pathology type, but it is altogether in the whole spectrum of lateral ankle sprains incorporated. And we wanted to know more about that. So what do we do? We dig into the literature. But strangely enough, except from some uh, cohort studies and, and athletic studies around um, collegiate athletes in the States, there was nothing out there. So we had the chance to team up with the uh, UEFA database on, on elite football led by Professor Ekstrand. And what we did is follow the athletes, over 3,600 athletes, over 15 consecutive seasons of professional European football. And we documented the injury incidence and the injury burden. And what did we see? We saw that the injury incidence during match play is 14 times higher compared to the training ground. There's a 7.5 annual increase in injury incidence. Just for your knowledge, in a few recent um, publications, in the past, it was mentioned that it was less than 0.4%. And actually, this shows that this is a problem that is much more predominant than we think. We are now hosting the Asian East Champions League uh, 22 teams competition here. And this early morning, we even had to perform a surgery on a similar injury. It is out there and it is increasing. Knowing also that 74% of the injuries are contact related and the mean is more than five weeks of a layoff, meaning much more than a simple so-called ankle sprain. What do we do? We wrap up the uh, way of dealing with this athlete coming in. We listen, we listen to the mechanism of injury, we look at it if we can, and we see if there is radiation up. We look especially on the imaging, we do the testing, and we feel. We use the tests that are out there, although, although they are provocative, they are not pathognomonic at all, but they are helpful in the full assessment in the menu of options that we can use in order to identify stability versus instability. I told you that most of the injuries in our data are contact related and match play related. Well, this is a training ground of a Premier League team, a player that was sent to us a few weeks ago with the video. This is not an ankle sprain. This is a player that gets stuck without any contact in a simple training ground movement that he performs or she every day and look still you have that dorsiflexion getting stuck into the ground external rotation injury this has nothing to do with an ankle sprain and now a little teaser for you all when i say it's not a little ankle not an ankle sprain at all we believe that with the similarities of the acl pathology that we see that is that there's no such thing as an ankle sprain, but also we should get rid of the title high ankle sprain because it has nothing to do with an ankle sprain. It is a syndesmosis pivot. And of course, we need to validate this idea, but we are pretty convinced that it's the position on the foot 
on the surface, as Dr. Athel Thompson clearly identified in his research and in the session of today, that there is a link between the foot position, the surface, and the eventuality of a syndesmosis tear versus an ACL tear. Our teams now are working on that, more to come, but just to send you a message that we might in the future think more about a pivot than a really um, high ankle sprain nomenclature because there is so many striking similarities with that mechanism that I've just explained. So back to the syndesmosis injuries, we have a classification that we can use. Grade one is never requiring surgery, grade three predominantly most of all, but in general, most of these injuries present as grade twos. And when we go back to the literature, we just want to know, is it stable or not? Is it stable? You don't need surgery. Is it unstable? There might be a somnolent or subtle instability that has to be tackled from the start to avoid that annoying chronicity of syndesmotic injuries that are very much more hard to treat. When we are saying that there, is signs, there are signs of instability, we meanly we majorly mean that there would be a deltoid ligament injury and or a positive squeeze test or external rotation test and or a widening on the x-ray with a radiation up to the IOL area plus five centimeters. It's a bit technical, but it is the challenge in syndesmotic isolated injuries because if it's unstable and we didn't identify it, we will regret it uh, two, three months down the line. So what do we do? We look at the golden standard. What is the golden standard? That is arthroscopy. But that means that many of our players will receive a sort of diagnostic arthroscopy saying that it's not unstable and they actually didn't need surgery. So that's not the way we want to work. That's not the philosophy that we cherish. So we came up together with Slim Bouhdida and, uh, and many of our team with a device that we validated. What did we do? We went to the cadaver lab and looked how a syndesmosis opened in the ankle and we validated that blindly with a physiotherapeutical assessment with the device. And we saw that in a particular dorsiflexion 20 degrees, there is a 100% um, significant similarity, which means that only in that position, we can rely on the device to say through a non-invasive approach, yes, as part of the options, this is a stable versus an unstable injury. I will not run into, run into the imaging um, specificities you all are aware of that and it's all out there now we also know that it's easy to say in a hospital focusing on athlete problems we do mris and we see what's going on but here we are all team physicians in a stadium in a room where there's only for example an ultrasound available well our data showed now that an ultrasound has good to excellent diagnostic value for complete discontinuity identification of the lateral ligament, ATFL, and the AITFL. So here we are. You don't even need your fancy material in the initial assessment. You can stick with your ultrasound and master that. That's new, that's helpful, and that's a good message to all of us. Of course, there are MRIs, CT scans, and uh, diagnostic arthroscopies. We all know that, and we can read about it in a more specific way. This is how it looks like. On the lateral side, left, you see the AITFL synovitis and the IOL diving into the joint, creating that very annoying anterolateral impingement of the syndesmosis. On the right side, you see a deltoid injury that is always uh, a much more debatable injury to treat. But when you perform a combined arthroscopy, you can identify it, treat it, and at least um, cover the expectations of the athlete in the most detailed way. How does that look like? On the right side, you see a hook test. If you're not sure, you just go into the syndesmosis between the fibula and the tibial plafond, and you see if you can open it up over 4.5 millimeter, which is the hook length that you can uh, see right now. You can also do it through a sort of shaver um, device where it's around four to five millimeter deep. And in a gently manner, if you can introduce it, it means it's unstable. So easy, right? Well, I can tell you, when you look at the literature and they say golden standard is arthroscopy, in these grade two B injuries that are subtle instabilities, it doesn't look like that. And then you go to the nomenclature and you say, okay, what is the, the, the validated outcome to do that? Well, there's none. 
So we came up with an idea to put a dynamometer on that shaver and gradually cut the ligaments, AITFL, IOL, PITFL, and then deltoid. And by doing so, we try to bridge the gap between the tools that we have for the moment and the instability itself and to see whether industry can in the future help us to talk the same language in the world and to at least um, create data that we can use for our research to proceed, to progress and to, as I said, improve in our treatment strategies. So this is the data that is on that paper. And furthermore, we have talked about the mechanism, about the diagnostic setup and about the imaging. But how do we treat them? And we all know there are screws and suture buttons out there. They all have their pros and cons. I will not go into detail. The pros of the screws in general are that the fixation is really rigid. The pros of the suture buttons is more that it allows for athletic participation a bit faster, a bit uh, more forgiving into uh, rigidity, and you don't have to remove them. Um, more than happy to discuss furthermore in the, in the links that we have provided with you. The real question is not how to treat them. The real question is there is still a big amount of malreduction out there where in about half of the cases, if you look at CT scan postoperatively, especially in fractured cases, that you have a malreduction compared to the contralateral side. This is unacceptable. And why is it acceptable for the moment? Because the ankle congruency is very forgiving for the initial stage, but not at a later stage with osteoarthritis as the final victim. So we now know how to put them in position. We know how to treat it. We know we have to compare with our imaging the contralateral side, and that's the way forward. The real other question in malreduction that is much of the problem is what is normal. If you look at the variability of the distal ankle, you will see that it's very hard to compare normal versus abnormal because it's all different sizes of anatomical landmarks. And that's still the real uh, question and the real um, uh, problem that we are facing and the challenges that we have to overcome. So uh, Dr. Alberto already uh, instigated the idea of uh, the research at the benefit of the clinical applications. Well, we're very humbled with the award that we won from the American Journal of Sports Medicine with our um, systematic review on the, uh, the value of these suture buttons versus screw fixations in our athletes. So uh, it is out there. There's much more of it than we realize. And nowadays, we try to create more consensus than controversy. And more and more nice papers are coming up. And one of them is, for example, from the Pittsburgh group, where they say hybrid fixation is the future, where they use suture buttons together with plate and screws. Another Irish group does beautiful work on the, on the tackling itself. And it's not just about treating the problem. It's also bringing it to the table of the leadership and the regulatory bodies, meaning that in most of these cases, we see that it occurs due to a bad tackle, which means if we can convince our referees and our governing bodies in sports that this is unacceptable, then more and more of these injuries can be prevented and hopefully it will be uh, going down instead of uh, increasingly up annually. One of our papers on that is that it's not an or or screw or suture button, it's an and and. We use a screw in a fracture case for fixation rigidly and then we remove it and, and alter it or replace it by a suture button for early mobilization. Use the winds of both and remove the disadvantages of both. So how can we improve? We've done an international survey on 970 uh, sports medicine foot and ankle surgeons all over the world. And interestingly, there is a fantastic geographical difference in how we diagnose and how we treat. So although we try to speak the same language, although we have so much data already out there, Many of us in different continents still treat it in a very different way. Um, that is something that we will present at the next Isicus Cape Town meeting because it's an, uh, a paper that is prepared from our group there and very much uh, excited to, to elaborate more on that in the near future. A very last word on the return to play because that's the real message to your athlete who comes in uh, with the question of what am I going to do now with my unstable syndesmosis? Well, we have looked into our data over the last five years and we've identified 110 male professional football players with 
an isolated syndesmotic unstable injury that required surgery. And this is a very homogeneous group in the type of uh, sport level that we were aiming for. What did we see? We saw that there's a return to play on uh, competition, a return to play on rehabilitation and a return to play on the team. And the results that we have is for the first time, because there's nothing in literature strikingly before, is that we can tell our player, if you have had surgery, your return to on-field rehabilitation will be around 37 days, your return to train with the team will be around 72 days, and your return to first match will be around 103 days. And with that, I would like to end the presentation and uh, greet you all from here uh, with warm heart. And if you want to read more about it, you're very welcome to contact us or uh, to, to look into the, the recent books that we delivered with our teams here all together. I think if you allow me all, it's time to wrap up our first online forum evening. Please stay tuned on the future forums on Aspeter social media. We had our initial problems with the sound and that is because of the fact that 1000 people immediately tuned in so thank you for your loyalty as i said before it's been great to have you and have a lovely morning afternoon or evening wherever you are in the world right now warm salutations and health wishes from your aspitar family to you all thank you very much and have a good evening see you next month on the next online series bye bye